This episode of Pick Up the Six podcast is brought to you by our friends at Mud Gear. We have an awesome new partnership to tell you about, and we love Mud Gear because they're made tougher, just like you guys. It's outdoor gear for the outdoor athlete. You can get it dirty, you can sweat in it, it's all good, and I absolutely love it. If you go to my Instagram, you'll see me rocking Mud Gear shirts and shorts on that Blue Ridge Relay, and uh, it performed really, really well. We've got a great deal going for our listeners. You go to mudgear.com, you use the code PUT6, that's the number six, P-U-T and the number six, and you're saving 15% off today. Great shirts, great shorts, awesome socks. They've got a bunch of different kinds of socks. They've got full knee-high socks for compression. They've got running socks. They've got mountain biking socks. They've got rucking socks. It's all good. Go pick it up today. It's made tougher. It's mud gear and it's 15% off at mudgear.com using the code PUT6. Go get after it, pick up some of their stuff and help support a great company that we love to partner with. If something happens to me, you should be sad, but not forever. That's what Sergeant Clint Ruiz told his wife Kyra before a deployment to Afghanistan in 2012. Clint did not survive that deployment. But through those words and his mission as a soldier, Kyra and her family are keeping his legacy alive today. She joins us to share her story and how Tunnels to Towers stepped into that story. This is Pick Up the Six Podcast. Brian Jodis back once again for another episode of Pick Up the Six Podcast and Kyra Ortega joins me. Kyra, good day and a when we were offline a second ago, I said, happy, it's Wednesday, right? The day we're recording. It's, yes. it's a few days after Labor Day. My schedule's all jacked up, but happy Wednesday to you. How you doing? Yeah, happy Wednesday to you too. Great. How are you? Good. Well, we're going to release this uh, probably next week as we record today, but uh, honored to have you on and, and share your story with our listeners because it's one that, as we always say here, we need not forget, right? And yeah. Ira lost her husband um, uh, in 2012 when he was serving yes. our nation in Afghanistan. So she's going to share that story, but there's a pretty incredible story about what comes from that loss and what has continued to grow and how an incredible organization like Tunnel to Towers steps in uh, to assist her family. Uh, and so first of all, just I'm just grateful to have you today. Yeah, thanks for having me too. It was great meeting you and talking with you so far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's good. I like the way these, uh, these journeys bring us together, right? Not by yeah, coincidence, definitely. not by accident. That's, that's for sure. So you went in the army as well, right? You and yes. Clint, right? Yes. Uh, yes. Me and Clint. Us, tell us a little bit about your service story and then how you guys met. Okay. So I went in right after high school, literally about 10 days after I graduated, I was at basic training. Um, and, uh, we both actually, Clint and I were both in psychological operations and that was when we were still able to enter the military as that MOS. Um, now they have to do Um, more training and you have to transfer into it. But uh, we met at our advanced training, our AIT training. And it's a really funny story how we met. Uh, He was really, really into me and I was really, really not. (laughs) And the first time that we actually met, he was uh, next to me. I was the platoon leader and I looked up at him and we're not allowed to wear glasses that have any type of logo or anything of the such on it. And they have to be all black. And so he had his Ray-Ban glasses on and he had sharpied out the Ray-Ban logo. And I thought it was the funniest thing. And so our first interaction was me looking up at him and saying, nice glasses and teasing him about it. Um, And from there, you know, he tried very hard and I kept saying, no, no, we're just friends. And it wasn't until after airborne school when we got to our units that I seriously gave him a chance Um, And he was actually there for me during hard times that I was going through emotionally. And so that kind of brought us together. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) A fateful pair of Sharpied out Ray-Bans. He thought he was being slick. Oh yeah. I'm not giving up on these. These Ray-Bans cost me way too much money to dump now that the army doesn't want me to wear them. I know, but it's, I mean, if you think about it, they're going to get ruined anyway. But I mean, I guess you just didn't want to spend other money, but. I just why why did you both make that decision to go right from high school, right into the army? What was that decision-making process like for you? So for me, um, honestly, I, it was a way to expand my horizons and mm. go see the world a little bit and to get my college paid for. And in a way that was honoring our country as well. 
Um, Clint actually did a year of college before he went in. So he was a year older than me. Um, and his reasoning was a little different. So he really wanted to make a difference and to serve, especially after 9-11. I think it impacted him as a child a lot. And he really wanted to show everyone that there is no good or bad guys mm. and that we are all just people on a different side and that, you know, we're all fed different information growing up, especially in different countries. And so he really wanted to show that we could all be together in harmony, kind of, you know, in world peace. So he had a bigger mission in his head, I think, than I did. Yeah, he really did. And it's a rather incredible perspective. And and now looking back on it, we'll talk about that fateful day. And it, 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 it will resonate even more as we explore a little bit of that. Talk to me about the training for psychological operations, right? What was yeah. he specifically gearing up to do? I know he had studied Korean. So if you guys go back right yes. to episode seven, we talked to Eric Maddox. He did all the interrogations, Kyra, that led to the capture of Saddam Hussein. Oh, wow. And he was a psychological guy, right? Interrogator. Yep. He was a Chinese linguist. And right. it was funny because when they recruited him, they were like, we need a ranger tab guy who's who's a linguist. We don't care what language it is. So they yeah. plucked this guy out, right? So what That's was going through, right? What was that training like, that psychological operations? And then, and then what right. kind of trajectory did it ultimately put him on? And, and then what did he head out to, to go do? Okay. So into our jobs, we have to all pick a language. And if you pick a language, it doesn't mean you're going to get that language mm. per se. And um, so he had picked Korean and I had done Spanish and he ended up still going to the Middle Eastern unit. So we all go to different units in psychological operations. And the training is really about trying to blend the minds of the locals and really try and get people to see our perspective and also see their perspective at the same time so that we can come to a resolution that's more peaceful. Um, and so he ended up in the Middle Eastern unit and in the Middle Eastern units, you're not sent out as a deployment of psychological operations. You're sent out as um, sort of support for SEAL teams mm -hmm. and for special force teams, Ranger teams and the such. And so there's usually one or two psychological operations specialists on a team that goes out any given day. And when they go to the Middle Eastern um, units, they don't get sent to the big bases in Afghanistan. You get sent out to the middle of nowhere and you're living basically in these tins for, you know, camps. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not as glamorous. You don't have, you know, any shops or anything like that. And um, their goal from my understanding, because, you know, obviously a lot of this is classified, so I sure. don't know all of what they were intending to do, but was to kind of get the local people um, and get what they were going on in their heads and vice versa. And to really kind of figure out what was going on in that area that he had gone to. Mm. You know, there's yeah. a lot of tactical war fighting components that are happening mm -hmm. during really that 20 year stretch, right. Of the Afghanistan uh, engagement. Um, but then there is, there, there's so much that must go into that part of it, right. The psychological, the yes. mental component, especially as you're dealing with folks on the ground and ultimately trying to, to get them missional with what we're trying to do. Right. And integrate right. In, in with what they're doing uh, as well. Was he also, and again, some of it you may know, some of it you, you may not. Is he also providing support for those teams? Right. So if it's if it's you're weaving in, weaving with yes. locals. Right. What's the level of support for those SEAL teams or the special operators that he's that he was integrated with? Right. I don't know 100 percent, but I know that when we're there for support, it's in our specialty. So our specialty is to really try and understand the people and kind of get their perspective. So I'm assuming is that they're providing the support and really talking to the families and trying to make a connection with families and the villagers and the places that they were visiting while the SEAL teams and special forces were conducting whatever mission that they had mm. in mind during that time. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Tell us about October the 25th, 2012, a, a, a tough and terrible day for for you and your family, but we want to take time to honor your warrior and, and remember yeah. his legacy as well. So tell us a little bit about it. So on the 25th, um, he and his team were out um, patrolling a local village 
And um, from my understanding, they were going to do an interrogation in one of the houses. And it had been a long day, long week in general. And they had told Clint that he could go and rest under a tree and just go relax while they had done the interrogation, that they didn't need him. And he did not want to do that. And so instead, he decided to go and pull security on top of the roof with um, a civil affairs officer, sergeant, and then also an Afghan police officer. And while they were pulling security up top, the Afghan police officer turned and shot my husband in the head and then shot the other guy in the head as well and had taken off. That was uh, Staff Sergeant Kashif Memon as well, yes. who was also yes. uh, up there that day. Uh, par for the course in Clint's character to volunteer to go up and work that security detail and rather take that break? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. He definitely wanted to be a part of it and wanted, if he was there, he wanted to work. Yeah. His whole thing was, if I'm here, this is what I'm here to do. I'm not here to really take breaks or anything else. And he wanted to be a part of it all. Before we, uh, I want to go back to his perspective, right? Because yes. cause obviously you hear that story and Kyra, we don't take for granted what it takes for you to tell it. We yeah. know that 10 years, uh, maybe at times seem like they inched by and maybe at times feel like they've flown by, right? Definitely. Your son Caleb, who was maybe only a year and a half old at that time, has grown up now. He's 11. Yep. Right? He's playing football. Um, so we don't take for granted, right, what it takes to do that. So we're thankful for that. His mindset was to show that that while there's good and bad, there are just ultimately different sides. Right. To know his mindset going into that and then to hear the story as to what exactly happens on that day. What were the what were the initial range of emotions? And then how were you able to right. process that in the years? Right. To come? So, uh, you know, obviously, my first initial reaction was disbelief. Mm -hmm. um, I just, you know, I was just talking to him on Skype. So or on Zoom, you know, and it was not even 24 hours later. And, you know, then it was just despair. Um, I ended up having to tell his parents, um, they were supposed to coordinate to tell us all at the same time it didn't mm -hmm. happen. So I had to tell his parents, which was just gut wrenching for me. Yeah. Um, and then I really wanted to honor his perspective and I really wanted to honor his mindset when it came to people in general. And so I've continued and I've raised my son to believe that there is good in everyone and that not everything is as it seems, you know, the, the Afghan police officer could have been bribed. He could have been blackmailed. He could have had someone that he loved killed by us. There are so many different things and scenarios that could have happened that we don't know. And so for us to spend our life hating him mm -hmm. would just be a waste and a dishonor to Clint's memory, in my yeah. opinion. You know, um, I've felt very fortunate obviously to hear these stories and share them, but also get to know my friend, Nick Lavery, who was a special operator in Afghanistan and had a similar incident happen to him where mm -hmm. the Afghan security uh, turned the weapon on his unit, shot Nick. He lost his leg, right? Was fortunate enough to survive. He should have died that day, lost his leg. And he says the same thing. He said, you know, I could have bottled all that up mm -hmm. in a bunch of hate and uh, vitriol he goes, but that, that I'd only be then tearing myself down. I'd only continue to tear others down. Right. I know it's not easy. I mean, I know it's not easy. 10 years of doing that. Yeah. Um, how, how much, right? How intentional? How much do you talk about that when you talk to other people? How much do you talk to Caleb about that now? Yeah. I, I mean, when he was younger, you know, he was only one when he passed. And so I started off small um, mm. because I wanted him to know that he was part of his life. So initially to kind of locate heaven for him. I always told him that his dad was on the moon. So anytime the moon was out, we would talk to the moon, you know, just so that he had a physical visual idea of being able to speak to his dad. And then as he got older, we had more and more discussions. And then now they, my son is so much like his dad in the mm -hmm. aspect of being so kind hearted and really trying to understand people and their motives. And so we talk about it often. Um, and he's at the age now where I think he's actually starting to have 
some difficulty in really understanding and having some anger and having some sadness that, you know, he doesn't have his dad here. Um, so I talk to him as often as he needs it. Yeah. He's entering yeah. a, yeah, you're right. He's entering that age, right? 11 yep. to 15. He'll have ups and downs with that. Yep. For sure. But it sounds like you've taken the time to instill that discipline and base in him. It's also just incredible to me, the fact that he was so young when that happens, but they share so right. many similar characteristics. Oh, my, they, amazing, they are identical. Right? It's amazing. Yes. It's crazy because a lot of things that you think that are behavioral things that you pick up, as a child from your parents, um, just from hand movements to facial expressions, things like that. They're so genetic with him. Yeah. It's almost like a clone copy of him. It's crazy. I'm sure sometimes you look at him, you're like, I... yeah. And as he only grows, it'll, it'll be similar. Oh, for sure. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And I think that's why it's hard sometimes for me, you know, sure. because I see him and I see his dad. I think as he gets older, once, especially when he turns, 22 it's going to be hard for me because it's going to be that age and it's going to be like whoa you know but um even when clint before he left um i think he had a feeling that he wasn't going to make it um we had a full-on discussion about the what ifs and everything else like that and um it's on his um, little niche for his ashes actually um and he told me this and he said if something happens to me you can be sad but not forever mm. so i've really taken that to heart as well and um, really tried to live my life because he would want that, yeah. you know? And so I try and instill that into Caleb as well, even when he's having those hard days. Yeah, it's it's an incredible way to do it. And I'll be honest with you, it, and maybe you feel the same way. That's an amazing gift for him to tell you that. Oh, I, I'm goes, so right? thankful. Like, I am so thankful because I, who knows how I would have dealt with the grief, you know, if we hadn't had that conversation. It would have been completely different because I would have no idea how he would have felt about me. I mean, I'm, I know that he's not here, but I still would have loved to know what he would have liked me to do or what he would have liked me to instill into his son, you know? So yeah, but even, in that, even in that short sentence, I think it tells oh, you a lot. So I much. It gives you oh, a yeah. lot, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. For sure. So um, family suffers just incredible loss. Uh, my heart goes out to you for having to, to bear that burden of telling his parents as well. That's yeah. you know, obviously devastating. But then through that, we've been able to talk to other families. We've been able to, to learn more. And boy, guys, I mean, you flip on the TV or you listen to the radio, you're probably going to hear an ad for the incredible work that they do at Tunnels to Towers. And if you don't know their story, go check it out. But really born out of the tragedy of 9-11 was this idea of wanting to, at the beginning, take care of our first responders, right? We had thousands of people who were killed on that day, but you had hundreds of firefighters and police officers and all these amazing people in New York that were running into those buildings. Oh, yeah. right? so Tunnels to Towers starts really to, to give some assistance to them. And then as the ongoing global war on terror escalates, right? And right. Got more families who are suffering loss, they step in to provide mortgage-free homes. And yeah. they stepped into your life. So tell me about, because the way, the way you got connected to them was, was a little twist of fate. And, and yes. Yeah, for sure. So <laughs> definitely. I was one of the first, we were the first group of families that they had reached out to. And so I had been checking my Facebook and I saw my Facebook, you know, message requests, you know, the ones that go into your spam mm -hmm. folder. And so I just happened to look at it and I get this message and it explains that they're this organization and they would like to talk to me and they'd like to give me a free home. And I was like, what? You're you know, like, wait a minute. I'm I've like, heard about okay, these Nigerian okay, princes sending right? me emails. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I was like, okay, well, I, I, so I looked, the first thing I did was look up the foundation and there was a legit, or a legit website and stuff. But even then, you know, you're like, I don't know. I don't know. So I ended up making the phone call and they told me all about it. And it was incredible. The, ideas that they had for families that had lost someone and already the incredible things that they had done for firefighters and police mm -hmm. officers, uh, families in New York and just all over the world. And, um, it turns out that another gold star wife actually lived in the same apartment complex that I did. And so, and then and there was another family that not ended up being Nancy Gass. Yeah. And she, you know, she, she was reached out as well. And it was almost like, I don't know if I can believe this, but it was incredible that the way that it ended up turning out and literally maybe six months after we were walking into our free home. Wow. Nancy was on this. Yeah. We had the complete honor and privilege to speak to Nancy a few months ago. 
So guys, if you haven't listened to that episode, uh, go back and she explains a lot about it. I mean, it's absolutely amazing um, uh, what what these organizations do, right? And, and the right. fact that it happens so fast. Right. Where what, You don't need to give me all the details if you don't want to, but sort of what's going on in your life at that moment? And then, I mean, right. was there a burden lifted after those six months? You're walking. I the- mean, it's incredible. All I've been doing was renting at the time, you know, and my son, how old is he at that point? I mean, he was very young in elementary school. I and, mean, he was probably and, seven or eight. Six yeah. Or so yeah. We're, when was we're, this? We're, 2017 timeframe? Right? Yeah. 2017. Yeah. Yeah. And so we're already actually looking for a home around, you know, the area and trying to find specific places based off of school districts and everything else. And I mean, they literally had someone come down and go look at houses with me and really look at like plots of land if you wanted to build. And I mean, it was a very in-depth, but very personalized and very, I felt very cared for. I felt very valued, you know, it didn't just feel like a foundation that was like, Oh, here's some money or, Oh, here's this. And they just do it for the looks, you know, they really care about our families. Yeah. Not just here's a house. Let's take a quick photo out front. Right. And then do they continue to stay engaged and and, and tell me what that relationship is like now? Yeah. So they often have, you know, the uh, 5k run that they do in New York. Mm -hmm. And, um, we went and did that. And then um, they often have the tower climbs as well and everything else. And so they keep us involved in that aspect. But I also get a monthly phone call every month and they ask me what we need. So they'll ask if Caleb needs, you know, resources in terms of therapy or if he needs resources in terms of tutoring. And they send me information on camps randomly, you know, and be like, hey, if you haven't checked this out, this is these are some camps. And I mean, they connect you to all these people. They even connected us to this artist that ended up drawing a personalized photo of wow. Clint. Yeah. I mean, and for free, you know, I mean, so they really want to be a part of our family. And I mean, you, I feel it every day. And it's incredible just being at my home and just being like, wow, like this is mine. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing. Uh, right. What are you guys doing? Uh, I'd assume they, uh, you probably want to help and give back and, you know, be a yeah. part of what they're doing there locally. I know that stair climb is usually in May, right? The Charlotte yes. area one. They've yeah, got April, those kind of events. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about some of that stuff. So the tower climb, um, they do some throughout the country. Um, but since I am based in Charlotte, they do a Charlotte one and we help do the fundraising, everything for that. Um, this year we were at the Mint Museum building. Um, and I think it was like 60 to 80 floors. Wow. Um, but I mean, it's huge. I mean, it's, it's huge and it's just crazy to see the turnout. Um, there's fire trucks, you know, police officers that come and support. Um, we had a ton of vendors this year that was just incredible as well. Um, but being around other people that really, that don't have necessarily the same personal connection that I have, Mm -hmm. but that are so willing to help and that really want to honor my husband and other loved ones. Um, this year we had photos on every stairwell of different loved ones. Um, so while you're climbing, you can see different people who have given their life for this country and just a little quote that kind of, you know, established everything that they believe into. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Have you been surprised at all? And just the, the outpouring of support, even when you just come across folks that, whether they're connected to tunnels to tower or not, just what that, what that support's been like. Yeah. I, I'm not one to ask for help mm-hmm. or to just, you know, willingly let people help me. Um, but tunnels to towers and just the people even connected with them um, have just been incredible. Um, they, you know, they do it such in a way that doesn't feel like they're giving charity. If mm-hmm. that makes sense, you know, yeah. they're giving it in a way that's like, no, we love you. So we want to do this for you. Yeah. I, I call that sort of missional alignment, right? Like they, right. they, they have a larger purpose Definitely. Uh, and their purpose isn't to give you a home and do a grip and grin and move along. They are yeah. driven to ensure that families get the support. And when you, when you approach it from that standpoint of really just love and service, right. And that's why they call you every month. That's why they offer. Yeah. And that's probably why you're like, I want to pour back in and help them where I can too. Yeah, it they ultimately it takes you back to Clint's purpose. Yes, so there's just a big connection there to me. I, I've said it, and I'll say it again. 
I really feel like his words to me about being sad, but not forever is just instilled in throughout Tunnels to Towers as well. You know, they've given me the support that wants me to live my life and be happy. Um, I was actually expecting um, my second child when they were giving me my home Mm. and the amount of support and love that they gave me and my new extended family was just incredible. I mean, they bought me gifts off of my registry, for example. I mean, just things that they didn't have to do. It it was, it was, it was just incredible. You know, they, they really instilled his words into their own mission. And I love that. Yeah. That's incredible. Guys, go check them out. Kyra, we're so grateful for you sharing the story, sharing Clint's story with us. Yeah, right? thank you. I want to make sure we take that intentional time and remember those uh, who have paid that ultimate price for us to be able to do this, right? For you and I to be able to talk today. Somebody's got to be willing to put it on uh, the line for that. This 11-year-old man is playing a little bit of football, right? So oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That, he... How's mama do with the young man playing football? <laughs> I love it. I'm competitive. Um, okay. So I, I love it. He's play, he plays D-tackle. Um, he plays some center. Um, he's on the O line. I mean, he lo- loves to play on defense. He would play defense all day if you'd let him know. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Right. <laughs> thanks for uh, thanks for sitting down with me and sharing your story. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. She is Kyra Ortega. I'm Brian Jonas. <laughs> that's been this episode of Pick Up the Six Podcast. <laughs>